to us and thanks for bringing everybody out in, our, in the cold weather you've given to us and we just thank you for the beauty of your creation and just for everything you give to us and just uh, help us always be thankful for everything. And pray you'll bless our church this year, this new year, and just bless everything that happens here. Uh, pray you most of all we'll just reach the lost for you and get people saved for your glory and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody have a birthday this week?
Let's read this together. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Okay? Thank you. You have to see. And what we're going to work on 
And what you want to pay attention to is God resisteth the proud. All right? Now, before we start here, there's something we need to talk about. Let's, let's talk about this for just a minute. And, and we need to kind of consider how we think about these things. All right? Now, God, did you just have a daughter that got engaged? Is that right? Uh, and I'm mean, I'm messing with kids. Like that's Maddie, right? Is that right? Which one was Morgan? Morgan. Okay. Morgan got engaged. Which one plays ball? Maggie Maggie plays ball. Morgan got engaged. Maggie plays ball. Okay. Are you proud of your kids? Oh yeah. No kid. <laughs> we'll get back to that in just a minute. <laughs> All right, Sam. Let's talk about your kids. you got two girls, right? Two. What do you got? One of these. A boy and a girl. Okay. Oh, <laughs> you know, it's going to take me a second. I'll get it. I'll get it in just a minute. Uh, Bert was two and Tyler was one. Two. And one. All right. And you know, I think, and this is just my opinion, I think you're truly blessed. You've got some beautiful kids. Are you proud of your kids? Yes. Okay, good. Now, let's stop saying that. You need to let me get finished here. Okay. Uh, Mike, how many grandkids you got? Two of them are Britons, right? One's Craig, Corbin. Corbin's the one that's all kind of squealing and squalling and kicking and knocking the furniture over back there. I'm like, oh, actually, makes a lot of racket back there. It's Corbin. Are you proud of your grandkids? Sure you are. Sure you are. Now, here's the thing, though, and here's what we want to talk about for just a minute. Now, Joe, he's proud of his family. He's proud of his daughters. He's proud of his grandkids. Is that okay? Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now, see, the, the thing is, when you stop and think about that for just a minute, how many times have you heard the preacher preach about the sin of pride? Okay? We know about the sin of pride. We know that pride is a bad thing. Okay? But now, we stand up and say, oh, I'm proud. I'm tickled to death. I'm proud as I can be of my kids, my family, my grandkids. You know? We have to figure out how to make that work, okay? Rather than just standing up and saying, I'm just tickled to I'm proud of that. <coughs> Everybody's proud of their kids. I'm proud of my grandkids, my family. I, we are truly blessed. And the true blessing with my family is my family's safe. And that makes a, that's a tremendous blessing. Tremendous blessing. All right. So, now, now we'll think about that. Now we'll get back to these kids and we'll get back to this in just a sec. All right? Now, Take your mind to turn to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, we are in chapter number 6. book of Proverbs, chapter number 6. The book of Proverbs, chapter number 6. Where? Are you proud of the Sunday school class? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. We'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to get rid of that one. <laughs> All right, look at Now, look at chapter number 6. Look at verse number 16. All right, what we want to talk about here for just a minute is this sin of pride. Now, this, this, is, a, this is a good lesson. This is a, short, this is a short, easy, right, direct, to the point lesson. We're talking about the sin of pride. All right, chapter 6, verse number 16. It says, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. Now, I have heard... Our preacher, other preachers, Sunday school classes, everybody jump on the idea that pride is listed first here. Of all these things that God hates, pride is listed first. Okay? Now, there are people who say, and people who believe in, and there's a little bit of, you know, you can kind of see it, that the sin of pride is the worst sin of all. God hates pride. God hates sin, but God hates pride more than he hates any other sin. All right. One of the reasons being the sins that come from the sin of pride. All right. We're talking lust, envy, greed, jealousy, and on and on and on it goes, which all stem from this sin of pride. Okay. Now, let's look at this here just a minute. My clicker's still broke. 
Definition of pride. This is a biblical definition of pride. This is the one we're going to use today. All right. Pride is excessive love of one's own excellence. That's very simple. It's very easy to understand. Excessive love of one's own excellence. All right. Now, there was a gentleman named C.S. Lewis, who is a reputable Bible commentator, who said, Pride is the original sin. It's the original sin that generates every other, and it's the vital principle in each sin. What this man is saying is that all of our sins come from the sin of pride. Now, that's all the Bible says. That's that man's opinion. Okay? And then he goes on to say, it was through pride that the devil became the devil. Right? We know about that. We understand that. This sin of pride, let me tell you something. And we need to remember this as we go. Pride is a very dangerous sin. And for a Christian person, pride is dangerous. We have, to, we have to really pay attention to what we're doing. We have to be particular about it. Even when we're talking about our kids, we gotta watch. We have to watch what we're doing. We have to be conscious of this. One of the problems with the sin of pride is that it creates in us an independence from God. Right? right? And what we begin to think because of our love of our own excellence is, I don't need God. I got this. Okay? I can do this. I'm getting on all eight cylinders here. I got my A game going. I don't need any help. Okay? We have to be careful about that. Now, the problem that the Babylonians had, they were eat up with this, and this was a part of their culture. Okay? It started with the Babylonians with the Tower of Babel. Remember? They're going to build this tower to heaven. We don't need no help. We got this. All right? All the way through to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was walking in the halls of the palace talking to himself about how great he was and how many wonderful things he had done and the Bible says that before he got the words out of his mouth God started to humble him. Okay? This thing, this thing with this pride, we gotta watch. We gotta watch what we're doing. We gotta pay attention. Now, you need to pen a piece of paper. You need to write this down. Alright? Here is Bible verses for your study this coming week. These Bible verses deal with the fall of Satan, the sin of pride. Okay? Work this into your Bible study this week. Okay? That's Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. Okay? Now, there's one more thing. While you're, when you get done right there, last week I gave you Psalm 84. And I said, put that in your Bible study this week. All right? This week, along with this, now I understand, you want to look at Psalm 83. All right? Go back one psalm. It deals with Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15. This deals with Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15. Put that all together and put that in your Bible study. Okay? All right. Back to the sin of pride. Now, We realize how bad this can be. We realize how dangerous this is. Okay? Now, what we want to do now is go back to the book of Esther, and we want to pay attention to what God's showing us through the book of Esther about this. Turn your Bible to the book of Esther, chapter number 5. Oops. Book of Esther. Chapter number 5. And we are at about verse number... Esther chapter 5, we are at about verse number 8. Chapter 5, verse number 8. Now, what we need to do, let's take a minute and talk about what's happening here and where we are. Okay? Chapter number 5, last week we talked about Esther and we talked about Mordecai. And we talked about the mark of courage. Remember John Wayne? Remember that? Where's Scott? Remember that, Scott? We talked about John Wayne. The quote that John Wayne said was, the mark of true courage is being scared to death, but you saddle up anyway. All right? We talked about that. We talked about the fact that Mordecai told Esther, you need to saddle up anyway. Okay? Now, what Esther did was, she saddled, she did. She saddled up. She went through it. She told Mordecai, she said, all right, what I want you to do is I want you to have all the Jewish people pray 
for me for three days. I'll have me and my maiden straight for three days. We understand that when we, uh, let me back up. He, she told Mordecai to tell his people to fast for three days, right? They were going to fast for three days. We understand that with this fasting comes prayer, right? You remember we were talking about hope? We talked about hope. This was Esther's hope. So what she does is she goes into the king. She said, if I perish, I perish. She goes into the king. The king extends this scepter to her and says, now I'm going to paraphrase this, all right? She goes in. The king extends the scepter and says, okay, what do you need? What can I do for you? She said, I want you <coughs> and Haman to come to a banquet that I have prepared. Okay? Now, your Bible, in these Bible verses, it talks about a banquet of wine. The king's all, this is more drinking. All right, he's all about this. He said, yeah, we'll be there. No problem. He takes Haman. They go to Esther's bank. Okay? Now, when they get done, the king says, okay, what is it you want? What, what do you need? I'll give you half the kingdom. Tell me what you want. Esther says, I want you to come to a banquet again tomorrow. <coughs> same time. Same thing. To another banquet tomorrow. Me, the king, Esther, the king, and Haman. Okay? That's where we are right now. Haman leaves this banquet and goes home. Now, what we want to do is take a look, first of all, at what Haman said. When chapter number 5, verse number 11, <coughs> right, Haman's been to the bank. Okay? He's going on. Look here. This man is busting at the seams with pride. He is eating plumb up with it. All right? I mean, he is talking about an excessive love of one's own excellence. This guy is full of it. Now watch what he says. He goes home from the banquet. He gets home and he's talking to his wife and his family, the kids. He says, verse number 11, all the king's servants and the people of the king's park. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me start again. Wrong verse number 11. Chapter 5, verse number 11. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him. How he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the kingdom. Haman said, Moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow I am invited in unto her also with the king. Okay? If you want to know how good this man is doing, all you've got to do is ask him. He'll tell you. Look over to verse number, chapter 6, verse number 6. Chapter 6, verse number 6. Now, what happens is Haman decides the next morning that he needs to go to the palace early. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So he goes to the palace early. Verse number 6, So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Right? What shall be done unto the man that the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to honor more than to myself. Haman cannot imagine the fact that there would be anybody else in the world that the king would honor other than himself. Right? So we see how this guy's thinking. We see what he's thinking now. Okay? I mean, he is oozing with pride. Right? Now, what we need to look at, and the way we need to approach this, and we talked about the book of Esther being like this mini shop. Here's God's show us. And that, hey, look, here's how this works. Okay? Now, God shows us this pride in Haman. And then he gives us scripture. Okay? The first thing that we need to understand about this sin of pride is God saying, no, no, no. Don't do that. All right? Now look at what this says. Proverbs chapter 16, 18, and 19. Pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. Better is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly that to divide the full crowd. He's God saying, don't do that. This is bad. All right? This is a bad idea. You look in the book of Proverbs number 21, verse 4, a high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. God said, don't do this. Okay? Now, let's go back to the kids. Okay? Let's think about them for just a minute. When we are proud, and I'm not sure that proud is the right word, we talk about how we feel about our families, our children, or whatever it is. And because of our children, and when our children do well, 
or our grandchildren, when they do well, it gives us this good feeling of satisfaction. You know what I mean? We get joy from seeing the fact that our kids are doing well. Right? And there's a lot of things wrong with that. Now, what we have to be careful about is there's a really fine line there. A really fine line that we don't want to go across. If we do, here's where we end up. Now, for example, my grandkids. I'm tickled to death with my grandkids. Okay? You know, I got a grandson that's 18 years old. He's in going to school at Virginia Tech and doing very well. And I, I, I get this feeling of satisfaction. I'm happy for him. You know, I feel good about it because he's doing well. Right? Now, you ready? The reason he's doing well, he gets it all from me. He gets his looks from me. He gets his brains from me. All of it comes from my side of the family. As a matter of fact, my grandson's probably better than your grandson. He's bigger, faster, stronger, smarter, and his girlfriend is better looking than your grandson's girlfriend. All right? See the line? See what happened right there? All right? Now we're right here. Okay? We cross that line. We have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. It is an extreme love of our own excellence. It can be an extreme love of our children's excellence. Right? What we have to remember, and we know this, what we have to remember, and we have to understand, the reason that my grandson does as well as he does, it's the grace of God. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with how good looking I am. Right? It's the grace of God when our children do well. When our parents, when somebody does well and we feel good about it, we have to understand it's through the grace of God. Okay? We don't want to go here. Okay? With me? Tom? We good so far? All right. Let me ask you this. All right, Corey, you ready? Tell them how you doing back there, bud. All right, well, let me just ask you this. <laughs> Do you consider yourself a proud person? I didn't, hey, well, I didn't answer my questions at all. Yes or no, okay? No. You don't? Okay, that's fine. Scott, do you? No. Do you see it? No. Okay. I quit trying to please people a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Okay, now, you know, you say no, no. Well, if you're not a proud person, that leads you to being a humble person. Are you proud of that? <laughs> you know, here's the thing. And he's he might say, Oh no, 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 I'm a home guy. You know, I'm I got my head down, I'm just doing my work. Alright? The way that you can tell a humble person, a humble person doesn't think about being humble because they don't think about yourself. Alright? They don't give a thought to the fact that they're humble because they never think about yourself. Alright? Now let me tell you this. And this is hard for me. This is a tough one. I'm a proud person. I'll tell you right off the bat. I'm as proud as proud can be. All right? Now, I'm not bragging there. That's not good. Okay? This is something that I have to be careful about and I have to watch all the time. It's that line. All right? You've got to be careful. You have to understand. All right? Let's, for example, this Sunday school thing. When we talk about this Sunday school thing, there have been several of you all, several times, who have come to me after Sunday school class or sometimes say, Dave, you really did a nice job with that Sunday school class. Uh, they, that, that was a good Sunday school class we had this morning. You know? People come out and say, Dave, you, that, you're doing good with that Sunday school class. Okay? Now, encouragement is a wonderful thing. We need it. I need it. You need it. We are supposed to encourage each other. But see, what happens is, you know, because I'm a proud person, I like them pats on the back. Oh, I, I enjoy that. You know, you can pat me on the back anytime you want to. Okay? But what happens is I begin to think, you know, that is a good Sunday school class. Right? That is, uh, they're doing very well. And it's because they got a good teacher. That's what it's all about. You know, once you get done patting me on the back, I like it so much. I'm just patting myself on the back. You know, that works fine for me. 
you stop and think, well, yeah, somebody says, hey, that Sunday school class is going great. You know, there it is. I'll work my tail end off for that Sunday school class. If it wasn't for me, they'd all be sitting around the table reading books to each other. Okay? You see where we, now see where we are? See where we just went? See that line that we just crossed? Now we are talking about an extreme love of my own essence. And it's wrong. It's a sin. That's what we're talking about right here. That's bad. So I have to pay attention because I don't get across that line. Now, let me tell you this, and I've told you this before. And if you don't ever know nothing, you need to remember this. The success of our Sunday school class is because the Holy Spirit has blessed our Sunday school class. It has nothing to do with me. There's a half a dozen of you in here who can stand up here and do this just as well as I do. Okay? It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the fact that the Holy Spirit is working in our Sunday school class. That's why we achieve the things that we do. Don't ever forget that. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So, we see Haman. We see God says, no, no, no. Don't do that. Okay? Now, Let's look at what happens to Haman next. Uh, let me get caught up here. Oh, Haman, when Haman goes home from the first banquet, the first feast, he walks through the gate, and guess who's standing there? There stands Mordecai. Now, Haman is busting at the seams with this pride and feeling good about himself, but when he goes through the gate and he sees Mordecai standing there, it, it's like Satan is just big. I mean, he is big. That's what's happening. What is going on with Haman is coming from Satan. That's where it's all coming from to begin with. All right? And Satan is just digging him. You know? Mordecai, if Haman would just keep his mouth shut, he's got things going his way. A year from now, Mordecai won't be there no more. As a matter of fact, all of the Jewish people will be gone a year from now. Haman's got it all set up and ready to go. But when he walks through and sees Mordecai, look, in the, look back in chapter 5, look at verse number 9. Chapter 5, verse number 9, it says, Then when Haman forth that day, he left the feast, joyful and with a glad heart. And when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up <laughs> nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. This time Mordecai didn't bow. Mordecai ignored him. All right? Haman walked through, Mordecai turned his back on him like he wasn't even there. This set this man on fire. Okay? He goes home and tells his wife when he's bragging about all this stuff. Look at chapter 5, verse number 13. It says, Yet all this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Okay? He can't get past that. So, his wife, all his friends that he's bragging to, said, Hey, just hang him. Right? You won't be let him hang him. Hang him, says, all right. That sounds like a pretty fair plan. I'll just hang him. So what they do is, in the middle of the night, they build a set of gallows to hang him on. The next morning, Haman gets up early and goes back to the palace. That's when he went in, and uh, the king said, how can I honor this man? How would, what would you do to honor a man? Right? Haman, that's what he's talking about. Me. So, Haman says, well, you know, if you want to honor somebody, uh, let them have your coat, let them have your cape, let them have your crown, let them hold that scepter, put them on your horse, and get somebody to walk them around through town and tell everybody how great they are. Okay? Now, bless his heart. The Lord, or the king looks at him and says, well, that's what I want you to do for Mordecai. Right? Haman, that's like a gut punch. He didn't see that coming. He thought he was going to be the guy on the horse. Right? Now, what happened is God begins this humbling process. Right? Now, hold that thought. We've got something else to do right here. Okay? Let's talk about what happened to the king. The night, that night, the night before Haman got there, right? after the first banquet, the king can't sleep. So he gets up in the middle of the night, walking around. He's got a servant standing there. He tells him, go get the books of the Chronicles of the Kings. Go get one of them books and bring it in here. Read it to me. And maybe I can go back to sleep. So the kid goes and gets the book that has Mordecai in it, brings it back, opens the book to the place where Mordecai, remember when Mordecai told the king he was going to be assassinated and he wasn't rewarded for it? And remember we said that's the problem, that is the problem of God. Well, right here, right here it is. Here's where it happens. Okay? 
Now, there's something here we need to think about, and we need, and then we'll move on right quick. But we need to understand this. Even a even a baby Christian, even somebody who's working, who's who's just working with the milk of the word, ought to be able to look at this and say, "Man, there's something going on here." Right? We're up to where we are now in the book of Esther. You have to understand, this king couldn't sleep. Well, it just happens that on this night he couldn't sleep. Okay? He gets up out of bed. He has got a whole palace full of women. I mean, if he wants company, all he's got to do is snap his fingers and they'll come running. Right? He doesn't do that. He tells his kid, go get this book. Well, it just so happens that the servant gets this book. Yeah. All right? Then it just so happens that that servant opens it to this place and begins to read. Surely to the world we can see now God working in these events. Okay? This is not coincidence. This just didn't happen. It wasn't done a lot. Right? We can surely see it now. One thing that we need to understand. God is not mentioned in this book. Okay? Now, the reason God is not mentioned in this book in the Bible is because God didn't want to be mentioned in this book in the Bible. All right? The reason is every time that we see something happen in our life, we don't have to have a billboard up on the hillside that says God did that. All right? We should be able to see this. And we should be able to see this now as we come through this book of Esther. You know, I don't need it tattooed on my forehead so that every time something happens, I say, oh, yeah, God did that. All right? We need to be able to see it and understand it. Okay? All right. Back to hand. God said, the Bible verses that we looked at, he said, don't do that. Don't do that. Now watch what happens next. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse number 11, it says, the, looks, the lofty looks of the man shall be humble." And the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord of them shall be exalted in that day. Next verse. Thou shalt exalt thyself, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars. Watch this. This will I bring thee down. Okay? Next. And by the way, and you all know this, there's hundreds of Bible verses in the Bible about pride. I mean, these are just some that I picked out. Uh, oops. One too far. Let's stop right here. You see where it says this when I bring thee down? First thing we need to understand. If we don't humble ourselves, God will. Right. Right? That's what them verses say. If you don't humble yourself, if you are guilty of this sin, and you don't humble yourself, I will. Okay? That's exactly what happened to Haman. Haman walks in. He's wanting to hang Mordecai. Next thing he knows, he's pulling Mordecai around through town on a horse, <laughs> shouting how good a man Mordecai is. Right? God humbled Haman. God will humble me. Let me ask you something. How many of you, the only thing I this, I have, this is happening, okay? I, and I know it. How many of you can say, yeah, oh yeah, I've been humbled by God. Mm-hmm. Okay? Good, good. So you know what I'm talking about. Now, when God humbled me and he's done it more than once, it wasn't any fun. It, it wasn't pretty. By any stretch of the imagination, he will humble us. Okay? So, now, Haman gets done pulling Mordecai around on this horse and he goes home. Right? Remember, this is the next day. Well, no sooner than he gets home, here comes the king's people saying, whoa, we are got to go to this banquet. Remember the second banquet when the king had asked Esther, what do you want to do? She said, oh, I don't want to have another banquet. Haman was all pumped up about this banquet. Okay? So, he goes to the banquet. Now, the king still... As he was still, he looks at Esther and said, All right, what do you want? I'll give you half the king, up to half the king. Just tell me what you want. Now, Esther is, Esther is cocked and ready here. She, this is what she's been waiting on. Okay? She looks at the king and she said, Well, I don't know if you know it or not, but me and all my people are going to be annihilated. We're going to be removed from the face of the earth. We're all getting ready to be destroyed. And the king says, what are you talking about? Right? Then he remembers. He remembers what he did for Haman when Haman was talking to him about destroying this group of people. The king didn't know it was the Jews. Now, here comes the kicker. Esther said, I'm a Jew. Right? Haman didn't see this coming. He didn't see this at all. The king had no idea. And now the king realizes Esther and all of her people are going to be destroyed. 
Well, this is one of them banquets of wine. He gets up, kicks a couple of trash cans, stomps outside. Now, I'm paraphrasing here. You do know that, right, Dan? That's not what the Bible says, but this is what happened. So he walks outside. Haman realizes now he's got problems. He is in a mess, and now he knows it. When he had these banquets, when he did these banquets, according to history, everybody reclined. They all laid on the floor, or they laid on the bed, or they laid on the couch, or they laid on the love seat, whatever it was. So Haman, when the king goes outside, Haman goes over to Esther, who's reclined on whatever she is, and just falls down right in front of her, beside her, to beg for his life. The king comes back in. The king comes back in, sees all this, and thinks that the man is trying to physically assault his wife. Okay? I mean, it's going downhill for Haman fast. He's trying to physically assault his wife, and he says, okay, I'll just hang him. Well, this is a little servant. They're standing over in the corner said, oh, by the way, he just did a gallows down there last night. He was going to hang him all the time. See, hang his luck is run plumb out. Okay? The king says, hang him. Okay? Now, here's the next part, and, and here's where we're going to finish up. God told us, don't do this. Then he tells us, if you do this, I will humble you. If you don't humble yourself, I will humble you. Now, once God humbles us, we're not, it's not done. We're not over. Okay? There comes the punishment. We still have to deal with the fact that we've committed this sin. Haman is getting ready to see God's judgment. All right? Now, Look at what this says. We're about to finish here. It says, The heathen, this is Haman, by the way, the heathen are sunk into the pit which they have made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known that by the judgment which he executed, the wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. That describes Haman to a T. Now, watch this. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Right? That's, that's fairly plain spoken. Right? An abomination to the Lord, though hand joined in hand, he, this is me, he shall not be unpunished. Mm-hmm. Okay? He shall not be unpunished. I have to deal with the fact that I have this sin in my life. God will humble me. Then I still have to deal with the chastisement. Now, you and I both know I'll be forgiven of it. Okay? And we will move on once I confess it. But I still have to deal with God's punishment. Okay? Alright? And in Haman's situation, God's punishment was Haman. Okay? Let me see more I'm at here. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. Okay? Okay. Caleb, you still with me? We're done. Right? I just finished up right there. Alright? Here's what we need to remember. Here's what we need to take from this. Now this is important. God says, don't do this. This is bad. We understand how bad this sin of pride is. We understand that we can feel good and have satisfaction about things in our lives. There's nothing wrong with that. We can't cross the line. We can't cross that line. God will humble you if you do. And then you will have to deal with whatever punishment he decides that you need to do. Okay. Okay. That went fairly well, didn't it, Missy? It wasn't too bad, was it? Is that like God's punishment, having to sit, <laughs> having to sit through that? Okay. Um, let's see. That's I'm a, sorry. Go just ahead. a quick clarification. Uh, you know, as far as being proud of your children... Mm-hmm. And you said crossing the line, which is good. But when you cross the line, I think is when we need to know that. When proud is, because the English language has always been changing, a definition of being proud is being pleased, like with your children, being pleased with what they're doing. And when the, the pride is outward, as far as our English definition, then there's not a problem with that. Because the Bible even says about God the Father that he was pleased with God the Son. 
And so that would be our definition of being outwardly proud. But the inward pride, that's when you cross the line. Like you mentioned about, uh, you know, well, I'm proud of my kids. Like, and it's all coming, you get to the point where it's all because of you and who you are. That's when you've crossed the line. It's because you're proud of what they're doing, but it's because it's a reflection of you. That's when the lines cross. It becomes a love right. Feeling, it's because it's become back to yourself. But if you're just proud of your kids because of their accomplishments and, and all that, and you're not thinking it's because you're anything or anything like that, there's nothing wrong with that because that's just a thing about being pleased. But that's when you know you've crossed the line is when it comes back as an inner reflection of yourself. Like you mentioned the Sunday school class, you know, if you're proud, uh, you know, hey, I'm glad everybody's growing, I'm glad they're learning. All that, but if it's because it comes back in your mind to you to lift yourself up, that's when it becomes the problem. Right. And that, that's what we talked about. That's what we talked about. For me, in my situation, that line, cross that line, that line can be very, very small sometimes. I mean, sometimes you jump across it and you don't even know it's there. So, in my situation, that's what I got. That's what I got to look at. Okay. Anybody else? See ya? We've heard the sermons several times about the different divisions of love. Okay. Can we not take pride and have different divisions of meanings of how a pride is applied in our life? Yeah. It's not any emotion. The pride of our children versus the pride of anger. Well, it's like any emotion. Emotions themselves are not bad, but it's like anger. Is anger bad? Well, it's not bad unless it's used the wrong way because even God is angry with the wicked every day. So every emotion, just because it's an emotion or just because it's something there does not necessarily mean it's bad. It's how it's used. That's what makes it bad. And same thing with pride, whether it's love. If we our object of our love is the problem, if we love the world, it's a problem. If we love God, it's not a problem. If we love our fellow man, it's not a problem. Um, so there's a lot of things like that in the Bible. Yeah, and I agree with what you said. You know, I think that I think the thing we need to be careful about, and we need to really we need to really pay attention to this. First of all, is how serious God takes this sin. Mm-hmm. Right? God hates pride. Okay, and we get to we get to tinker around with what we can. Yeah, yeah, that's what the Bible verse yes, is about. Yes. Yeah, but and we get to tinker around with. Well, this is okay. This is not. We have to be very careful. We gotta pay attention to what we're doing. There's not a thing in the world wrong with being proud of your kids. There are things in my life that I am truly proud of. First of all, we gotta understand that, that all comes from the grace of God. Right? Next, we gotta be we gotta watch. We gotta watch that line. Like he said, and that's the same thing for you see that or something. It's okay, but we at least gotta be careful. We gotta watch what we're doing. I think a big thing with pride is understanding the definition that you're using. When you say like, you know, I'm I'm proud of my accomplishments. It's just you're, you might be proud of your accomplishments because of what it's done for others, but not because of what it's brought to you. And that's not a bad pride, but it's because it pleases you. That's the definition. But the definition you gave there was a good one as far as excessive love of one's own excellence. That's when it's a problem. You've come across the line. Yes, that's when it's a problem. I have people that uh, have a son or daughter that is a fanatic killer. It's a love killer. Okay. My son is my son's a murderer. What about well, I mean, how do you deal with that? Well I'm definitely not proud of it. You're not proud of Mark, but I'm sure you're still proud of him. They've done some things that were successful. That's possible. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. That's there are still things. I mean he's still my son. I love him. Okay. And there are there may be some things in his life that I am proud of, but I have to make sure that I keep <coughs> that separated, right? right? And, and and for me that's the hard part. Uh, there was some there was some I forget what it was. I'll think of some big story I was going to tell you. I'll tell you next week if I if I can remember. Yeah, I'm always trying to simplify it for myself. Uh, it's okay to be to take pride in your work. You just don't be proud of it. Yeah. The Bible tells in the book of Proverbs to let another man praise thee and not find another way. There it is. And pats on the back. Let yeah. somebody else. All right, for you to be proud of your yeah. kids and stuff. And other people come up and say, hey, that boy here is a good boy. That girl here is a good girl. So praise the Lord. You know, it's when you turn it around and start taking credit 
from the good things in your life yeah. is where that line of pride is from. It, it good, you the baller man, and I'm sure you took pride in your work. Mm-hmm. You did a good job. Mm-hmm. Because you was one for a long time. But it's when you go around when other people start saying, hey, they did a good job, you say, well, of course you did. I did it. You know, several years ago, our son was a senior in high school at James Monroe, and they had the first undefeated football team that was at James Monroe. Well, they went to the state semifinals, and during the course of the ball game, my son, and I'm sure y'all, I don't know if you know Matthew, you remember Ben Thornton. Ben Thornton played on that football team. Anyhow, my son threw about a 60-yard pass. I mean, it was pretty straight in the air. Pow! Touchdown. Right? The guy standing in front of me, he turned around and said, man, that's good. I said, yeah, that's my boy. <laughs> 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 yeah, there you are. He just stepped across the line. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Anybody? Yeah. Ethan, did you pray in church this morning? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you did. Thank you so much for it. Caleb, I see you, son. You you do not pray. Like you? Like you?